Hi, this is Ken McCarthy of Jazz on the Tube, and anybody who's been a regular listener, viewer, follower of Jazz on the Tube knows that we love New Orleans. And every chance we get, we want to remind people what a great place it is, uh, how important it is to visit. And today we have a book that we're going to talk about. It's called New Atlantis, Musicians' Battle for the Survival of New Orleans. Let's welcome our, our distinguished guest, John Swanson. Ken, thank you very much. Hey, talking about tradition, maybe this might be a good place to wrap it up. And talking about uh, Jelly Roll Morton, he talks about the Mardi Gras Indians. Um, and this is a tradition that if you're in New Orleans, you, you, you can't help but see it everywhere, see influences it everywhere. But if you're not in New Orleans, you may not even know what the heck it is or have ever directly experienced it. Can we talk a little about the Mardi Gras Indians and how important they are to the whole New Orleans uh, scene? Well, um, when Africans were brought to the United States as slaves uh, in the early days of the colonies, they interacted with the Native Americans who were around, um, and they shared a lot of a lot of uh, cultural similarities. And uh, they were na- they were natural allies, you know, which who shared, if you will, a common enemy in the the colonists who uh, had come to take away what the Native Americans had and had taken away what the African, uh, now African Americans, uh, had enjoyed in their homeland, uh, their, that is to say their freedom. So there was a, a, a strong cultural interaction from the very first days of their meetings between African Americans and Native Americans. And uh, that, I believe, is the beginning of the creolization process. The colonists who controlled all the official records were very afraid of the potential of the slaves and Indians banding together to revolt. So um, they suppressed this connection. But it's a long-standing connection, and it's a blood connection. And it's a blood connection that's been hidden. One of the one of the other main characters in uh, New Atlantis is, is Cyril Neville, and one of the stories that it traces is his understanding of his heritage as not just an African American but as a Native American. He found out uh, through his uh, uncle George Landry that uh, that there was Indian blood in in the Neville family. And he went and researched it and found connections in the uh, the Indian nations and uh, established those connections and brought some Native Americans on stage with the uh, Neville brothers at Jazz Fest and in turn they they named him uh the, the I believe the Choctaw tribe uh, named him the uh, ambassador to the outside world uh, for themselves. And uh, this, the Mardi Gras Indians, of course, is a, is a reflection of that. Uh, they're also called, uh, and called in the black neighborhoods, uh, the black Indians. There was a French name for black Indians. Uh, the, it's a, I don't know all of the details of this. There have been some really good studies on it. So, and, and also a fair amount of the history and the culture of it is um, occult in the sense of hi- secret and hidden. And it's deli- I mean, part of it, as you pointed out, is, uh, you know, nobody ever wants to give credit to these cultural forces. I mean, not, not, not that nobody does, but the official, our official, you know, uh, hates to give credit to, to, to uh, these kinds of cultural sources. But on the other hand, a lot of the traditions of the uh, Mardi Gras Indians are for the Mardi Gras Indian members only. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of a lot of some of the history, some of the language, some of the meanings of the chants. These are not something you can just uh, say, "Hey, you know, what, what are you guys doing?" It's 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 for mem- you know, it, it's for members. It was it was um, I believe it was a survival mechanism, a survival training. Part of the Mardi Gras culture is just to deal with with the uh, tremendous uh, strains and stresses. Of, of, oh, uh, it's absolutely living. true. I mean, New Orleans was essentially an, an apartheid city right up until 1965 uh, uh, as as Cyril Neville points out um, you had to as a 
young black person, you had to be able to read so that, as he put, as he quoted his aunt saying, you didn't accidentally stumble onto death by, you mm-hmm. know, drinking the wrong water fountain or going into the wrong restroom. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so this this tradition is, uh, uh, and, and and then there's there's some sort of an ancient connection, which is that during the French period, uh, the Code Noir, which was the the l- rules that regulated slavery, permitted for uh, Sunday after Sunday mornings off, and uh, both um, Africans and uh, Native Americans would congregate at a place that's now called Congo Square. And then you just just understand how profound this is because a lot of people just don't know this history. In British North America, it was illegal to play the drums under penalty of death. Yeah. All right. That that's how frightened the uh, uh, the Anglo American slave uh, enterprise was of the power of this culture and of of music in general and of drums in particular. So really the only place in North America, and of course in Cuba and Brazil, it was different because that wasn't the, uh, the, the Anglo-Americans, but the only place in North America really where the music was allowed any breathing room at all was specifically in New Orleans in a place called Congo Square, which happened to be a former um, sacred spot for the Native Americans. So there's almost, there almost certainly was personal interaction between Africans and Native Americans, and by the way, not just African, you know, Africans from all kinds of backgrounds and tribes, people that might not have ever met each other in Africa, uh, who were thrown together in New Orleans. So some of the most, and, and some of our r- r- most important rhythms, uh, it, a case can be made in American music, can be traced back to Mardi Gras Indian rhythms, in which case we're really talking about African and or Native American rhythms in, in a kind of fusion. So this is pretty deep stuff. And, and just one other point that every lover of music should know, that if you go to Mardi Gras, uh, if you go to um, uh, Congo Square and just cross the street and walk down, I think, two blocks, you're at the recording studio where basically rhythm and blues rock and roll was born. A uh, Sicilian American, uh, I always mangle his name, Cosmo. Cosmo uh, Matasta. Yeah, Cosmo Matasta. People are. This is another little fact, but around the turn of the last century, the, the French Quarter was about 90% Italians, and they were treated pretty badly. So Cosmo had a great sympathy for blacks and black musicians, and he was the first man to record black musicians in a formal recording studio in New Orleans. Up, and that didn't happen until the 50s. If you if you want, you know, why? You know, if you ever wonder why are all these Louis Armstrong sides coming out of uh, Chicago? Because if you were a black musician in New Orleans, you were not welcome in a recording studio in the city. And that took until the 50s, and it took uh, this one man to, to break that. But the, the point, that's a sort of a side story, an important one. But the point I want to make is Congo Square and his recording studio, if you have a good arm, you could literally throw a, a, a rock from Congo Square and hit that recording studio. So there's something Ramp- different Indian. about more. <laughs> and Ram, right, Rampart and Dumain, which is referenced in a lot of music, a lot of uh, New Orleans music. So there, there is something magical about New Orleans and and what goes on there and what goes on to this present day. And, and when you look at the, and as John documents in his book New Atlantis, when you look at the the incredible heroic efforts these musicians came uh, made. They'd lost, they'd lost everything, too. They lost their homes, all their possessions, often their musical instruments, their cars, uh, their neighborhoods, their communities. I mean, their money, so, such as they had. They lost everything, were, were pushed out of town by this disaster, and they were the pioneers that came back with really no help and no support, really, except from fellow artists, and uh, re-enlivened the city. And, wow, and the city's rocking now. I mean, you go down there now, you, you'd almost, unless you, you get off the, the, you know, get out a bit and drive really around, you'd never really even know that, that this disaster happened, the, the main areas. And let, let's tell people where you should go. Guys, uh, Bourbon Street is worth about five seconds. Uh, where you really want to go is Frenchman Street. Uh, That's Frenchman right. Street. Yeah. <laughs> the new music capital. And the, uh, yeah, the just, uh, you, you go from... Uh, uh, where uh, Esplanade and uh, Decatur 
end, right uh, right around uh, where Checkpoint Charlie's is, and you walk right down Frenchman Street, and you're gonna you're gonna pass a dozen clubs where uh, the music just spills out onto the streets, and it's it's all kinds of music. It from the very beginnings of jazz to the very latest uh, uh, hip hop brass band connection or the uh, the nouveau swing. Um, that uh, Donald Harrison plays now uh, to, you know, to, it, it's, it, the whole history of jazz is on display. Uh, and uh, y- there are a lot of young people there as well who are representing the, uh, the newer forms of music that uh, exist in the pop landscape. A lot of young people have moved to New Orleans because it's an uh, affordable place to live. And it's a, it's a place to, uh, sort of rough it and have adventure. It's a good place to be young right now. Uh, yep. It's and not then, a good and, and, be uh, to be old uh, because the health care system is bad and, uh, you know, it's a very poor city. But but if you can if you can rough it and, and uh, like adventure, it's a great, great place to be right now. Yep, yep. And, and if you love music... Um, and, and if you get yourself, when you get yourself to Frenchman Street, because I hope everybody listening gets there, you'll meet people. It's a very friendly city. You will make friends uh, much faster than you can even imagine. And people will fill you in on the other spots because there's clubs scattered around the city. You just they're an odd, Some of them are in odd places, and you just have to know uh, where they are. And, that's, and you'll figure that out once you get to Frenchman. But on Frenchman, what are there, about 10, 12, 15 clubs in a, in a block? Literally, yeah. I mean, every other every other doorway is a club. Uh, it's either a club or a restaurant. The Praline Connection is there, and the, the deli. But uh, everything else is a club. Yeah, there got to be a dozen clubs at least right along the two block section of the uh, uh, of uh, Frenchman Street. I also uh, would like to point out that uh, uh, all of this that we're talking about is has been very beautifully portrayed uh in the HBO series Treme and they've they've uh we're going to get another we've had two years of it and we're going to get at least one more year and uh, I would like to say that if if anybody is a fan of the of the series and they are wondering what we're going to see next season well I think if they pick up a copy of uh, New Atlantis Musicians' battle for the survival of New Orleans. They may get some hints about what will be in the next <laughs> series. Oh, great! Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, we we could easily talk about New Orleans and and its history and what it continues to contribute and what it's been through and how it's evolving uh, for the next month. But we we'd have to cut it at some point. So this might be a good place. Um, we're talking. We've been talking with John Swenson. Uh, author of New Atlantis, Musician's Battle for the Survival of New Orleans. Just a great, great book. Uh, all praise to uh, Oxford University Press for having the, the wisdom to uh, put this book out there. If you love jazz, if you love the music, if you love New Orleans, my God, this is a, an, a, an obvious thing. Support this book. best way to support a book, of course, is to buy it. Uh, you might have friends that you think would like it. It makes a great present. Again, your librarian, I'm sure, with all the budget cuts they're facing, would be delighted to see a book of this caliber in their collection. You never know what happens when you get the book to a library, how many lives will be touched by it. New Atlantis by John Swenson. John, thank you for taking the time out to tell us a little bit of the story. I know that the full story is vast and fascinating, and I am so uh, grateful to you for for making sure that this, this story did not get lost. Thanks very much for your work, Ken. I mean, it's very, it's been very illuminating. Great. Well, thanks, and maybe we'll run into each other in, in New Orleans or maybe New York. Okay. All right. Well, this is Ken McCarthy uh, for John Swenson uh, saying uh, goodbye on behalf of Jazz on the Tube. Uh, get yourself a copy of New Atlantis.